Thank you very much, Gordon, for inviting me here just to interchange some views. Uh, I gave this title, picking up some issues uh, from a book that is going to be published next May or June by Pagan Macmillan. And the title of the book was, is Quo Vadis. When I gave this title to Palgrave in London, they said, now we have to pay uh, uh, you know, previous movie titles or whatever. And then I explained that Quo Vadis was a little ancient as a sentence than the movie. Uh, <laughs> so they decided to give this title and uh, to complete the title of this, this Quo Vadis, World right Europe, yep. Quo Vadis. Uh, we can start uh, with few slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's start with figure one. First question, is there a world economy crisis? The answer is no. There is no world economy crisis. As you can see, there's been a crisis around 2009, but uh, uh, after that crisis, one year crisis, one, two year crisis, the point is that uh, the emerging countries, uh, the Asian countries uh, uh, are going to grow maybe a little less than the past 10, 15 years, but much higher than US and Europe. Second question, is this the century of the hand of Western power? How is the economic and political power moving around the world uh, within what we call globalization? <laughs> globalization, according to my opinion, is uh, changing the power in the world economy and in the political power. So the question mark is, is this the end of Western power? Uh, my answer is yes, if, if we are myopic and stupid, maybe both Europe and US. No, if we have a little foresight view of what's going on in the world economy. Uh, within this framework, the problem is a declining Europe. You can see the bottom line is Europe. All the other line re refers to the different continents in the world. So Europe is down there. I put obviously historical data until 2013 and forecast by Oxford Economics until 2018. So there is no world crisis. There might be a, an end of power from Western countries, Western, I would say, civilization, culture, the Western way in which we define democracy. Third, there is a decline in Europe. And obviously, uh, a decline in Euro area, <laughs> which is... Uh, going to be a little lower than the European Union. Now, if this is the framework we face, this is a little game I uh, started to do in 2000, 2001. Uh, trying to project in the long run uh, percentage of world GDP according to different countries. In 2005, I did publish a book in London in which for the first time I plugged in this slide, this figure. And then I said, look, if the world continues to grow as the average of the last 10 years, in, 19, in uh, 2015, China will be first and US the second in terms of total size, obviously, not per capita, <laughs> total size. 
uh, then India, then Russia, then Japan. And you can see in this slide, or better, you cannot see in this line any single European countries. They are all below, confusing each other with no weight in the world economy. Uh, now, that time we had the, the G7 plus one as the world government. So we, we had this kind of governance to face globalization. An old governance uh, of the last 50 years, maybe, facing a new world. Can we go far by continuing to use uh, the G7, G8? Uh, we try to do, to mix it up the G20, that I define as my condominium in Rome. We have uh, 15 different families, we meet each month, uh, and the roof is leaking. This is more or less the G20. Okay. Now, the point is that if you see more or less around 215, which is today, um, little, very little is changing with respect to these slides. First, China. Second, USA. Third, India. Then Russia. Then Japan. Then you may choose any other African countries, maybe South Africa or whatever. Korea. Uh, facing this slide, the G8, even today, is made by USA, <coughs> Canada, Germany, France, Italy, UK. Who else? No, no, no this is not the G7. USA, Canada, UK, France, Germany, Italy. Japan, okay? Plus one, and sometimes it's minus one, as, <laughs> as during this stupid uh, vision about the Ukraine crisis. You know, we Italians, we know very well that we had over the last 2,000 years three Crimea wars. The first one was in 1998, after Christ all the Western power against the Muslim. Then in 1854, I think, and we know very well because by making that war in Crimea, the reign of Piemont did, after that war, the reunification of Italy. <laughs> At that time, the European power against the Russian in favor of the Muslim. So they changed the alliance. Okay. And then we had the third Crimea war, which is this. We are facing. Anyway, the actual G8, with or without Russia, I would say with. Uh, I'm not sympathetic with Mr. Putin, but this is some kind of geopolitical, geostrategic view. Can this G8 be the governance of the world in the next 20, 30, 50 years, while the new G8 is this other one. The new G8 in terms of power is, I repeat, China, US, India, Russia, Japan. Then you can put one African country, Brazil, South Africa, seven. Where is going to be Europe? No single European country can alone have the power to sit there and face the world situation. Now, the trick is that, uh, <laughs> you know, in Europe, we, we are very pragmatic. Instead of having a political government in Brussels, in Brussels we have a, a statistical office, Eurostat, okay? If I pick up the Eurostat statistics, where is? Oh, they missed one. I missed one slide. No, it's here. It's here. It's here. Uh, if we put together EU25 that time, 
you see that both USA and European Union will have a declining share of world GDP, but still China will be the first, still USA will be the second, but the European Union will remain the third world economic power. And then you have India, Russia, Japan, North Korea, Brazil, and whatever. So you have the G7, the new G7 there, G7, G8, <coughs> at one condition. Either the European Union has one seat <coughs> as USC, or European countries will disappear from the world uh, governance. And in the meanwhile, The BRICS, as you may know better than I, last year, they decided to get together to maybe had uh, their own World Bank, maybe to have uh, their own uh, IMF or whatever. So what are we waiting for to change the institutional framework and the structure of world governance before they will change without, without us. We were so stupid in Europe, and I conclude in two minutes. Oh, we have been so stupid in Europe, mainly in the Euro area, to grant, first to US, but mainly to China, more or less 40% of competition through the rate of a change. Let me tell you today uh, how I am proud of myself, mainly because over the last 10 years, starting 2002-2003, better, in January 2002, uh, the World Economic Forum held in New York right after the two hours, after September 11, was held in New York in January. My friend uh, Bob Mandel and I, we gave a little press conference there. And uh, that time we said, look, be careful. We need to put the brackets between dollar and euro to have uh, a bracket maybe around 0.90, 1.1. Because otherwise, the danger is an overappreciation of euro which is not safe even for the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy, okay? So we have been so stupid to grant China through the pegging to the dollar when the dollar is devaluated. It's the first time since Moses, best, uh, the best uh, treasury minister of the history, is the first time that a, a huge country, a big country, having a huge surplus in the current account of balance of payment that devaluate the currency rather than appreciate. Okay. I was told for 10 years by very important world economists in, around the world, in Europe, in Brussels, uh, I did fight uh, very hard with Mr. Trichet when he was the president of the VCB uh, because they, anytime I said, well, you know, the rate of change, you have to take into account <laughs> that if you appreciate your currency too much, you're going to lose growth and employment. That's it. Uh, I understand the structural reforms. I understand the fiscal policy, whatever you mean. But why should we have this negative effect from a super euro? Mr. Trichet many times said, uh, well, my target is to take inflation under 2%. And I said, yes, you will take inflation not only under 2%, under zero, it, together with growth. OK? And I was told for many years that the rate of, the rate of change is made every day, every day, in financial markets. So it's free. This is the most stupid thing I ever had. It's clear that markets behave every day, determine values, but on the basis referring 
to the structure of political of economic policy and political economy around the world. The proof is these weeks, these months. As soon as Mr. Draghi, my classmate at MIT, so we have the same kind of vision with the same kind of teacher, when, uh, when Bob Solo was granted by the Nobel Prize, I called him by phone early in the morning in the US, and I said, Bob, at last, at last. He said, why at last? Because you, <laughs> you are the third, the third of my thesis, the reader of my thesis, and I already had two Nobel Prizes, so you are the last one. <laughs> well, when Mario Draghi uh, got the, the, the responsibility of the ECB, I was sure. I'm telling since two years ago, as soon as he took the position, that he was going to do what is the duty of monetary policy. Obviously, facing a deflation uh, zero growth, what you can do? You give liquidity, and the target is take inflation higher, take the, the, the euro lower. <laughs> That's it. Going back to the parity. I'm doing another little essay these this weeks, and I did calculate what is the cost of stupidity in Europe. Cost of stupidity lies on the quantitative theory. Mr. Fisher, the price times GDP in real time equal, and so on. And I used to tell to my students that this is a tautology, obviously. Become a theory if you say that production is always at full employment and the velocity of circulation of, of money is given. If you give these two different variables, then, then money affect only prices. Okay? That's it. But this is so stupid that there is some interrelation between money and the real economy. My central study, the name is Economia Reale, which is real economy. <laughs> uh, 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 I did some calculation using, you know, econometric games. Okay, the Ox I, I use the Oxford econometric model, which is very good model. Has uh, the world economy, Europe, all the country linked to each other, but mainly because it's very cheap <laughs> to be used. <laughs> anyway, uh, I did the simulation. What is the cost of this kind of European stupidity? Arrogance. I'm not uh, referring to Germany. No, no, it's true. It's, it's a common stupidity. Because we in Italy, for years and years, we did go to Brussels, uh, ask for pity or whatever, or uh, uh, telling inside Italy, well, this is the Europe. The Euro is calling us. The Euro is uh, forcing us to do this and this. So this is collective stupidity. Lead, maybe led by Germany. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, so if we had the, the Euro around the parity started in 2003, up to now, until 2014, with any other condition remaining the same in the structure of the model, okay, we would had a higher GDP in the Eurozone by 20%, to be precise, as I said to Gordon before, is 19.95. <laughs> so in these 12 years, the uh, as we call the super euro, uh, uh, reduced growth in the eurozone such that we lost, we lost at the end of the period a cumulative estimate. And in 2014, the GDP in, in the eurozone would be higher by 20 percent. 
20 percent around it's an estimate obviously it's not well, it's just to give you an idea 20 percent in cost and price around uh, it is 10 10 million billion 10 trillion euro the uh, eurozone gdp 20 percent is two two trillion okay which means that we lost the total GDP of Italy, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland. More or less, in these 12 years. So let me end by saying the future of Europe cannot be but USC. The future of Euro cannot be but a normal currency in which uh, a monetary policy, fiscal policy can behave to have the rate of exchange as an instrument, no as a target, <laughs> as an instrument of economic policy, but not as a target to be strong. Thank you. Uh.